It is my pleasure to introduce today's presenter, Prague Salva. While Prague was a student at the University of Maryland College Park, he had a student job on campus as a network technician. He learned enough to start as a network administrator as his first job out of college. For the next years, he progressively advancing roles, supporting numerous commercial, government, and DOD networks. They involve networks of various sizes and a wide range of technologies. In addition to gaining valuable experience, he earned Novell, Microsoft, and Cisco certifications. In the year 2000, he started teaching Cisco courses here at Global Knowledge and taught CCNA, CCNP, VOIP, and BGB classes. After a brief hiatus from technology, he resumed teaching general networking and security classes for Global Knowledge. So with all that, Prague is yours. Let's begin. Thank you, Brent, and uh, welcome, everybody. All right, let's jump right in, and uh, let's talk about the overview for today's webinar. First of all, uh, thank you very much for, for attending this uh, webinar, and um, I'm hoping to make this valuable use of your time, and uh, hopefully you, you'll uh, benefit also from some uh, good knowledge that you can walk away immediately with. Yeah. All right, so why is this information so important, right? The networking foundation, why is it so important? That's the first thing we'll talk about. Then we'll talk about some of the basics of the OSI models, switching, routing, and TCP IP and subnetting. Obviously, we'll, we'll touch upon just the, the bare basics, but uh, the idea is to get you to think about what else there is to explore about this. And um, uh, at the same time, the, the most crucial information you need to have on these topics, you'll have you'll get at least uh, to some extent in this webinar. Yeah, and of course, then there will be some time for Q and A. So, why do we need to know this? So, if at all you are responsible for designing, operating, managing, or troubleshooting networks in any way, shape, or form, it's virtually impossible to do it without understanding these foundational concepts, these ideas, really well. Right. If you don't understand any of these concepts really well, then you can sort of do your job, I suppose, but you definitely, I, I, you, I wouldn't consider you to be very good at that without this foundational knowledge, right? Uh, anybody, including myself, right? Not just you, but any of us. So, so that's, that's why it's critical, you know? And I've seen, by the way, in lots of our classes, you get networking professionals who lack some of the other areas of this knowledge and yet they've come to more advanced classes, which uh, you know makes me wonder how successful they'd be at their job, though, right? Uh, so that's that's why I feel this is this is a great class. Also, the the class related to this webinar I feel is great for that reason too. It gives you all the basics. Now, the OSI model, <clears throat> basically, it's very important to understand the OSI model uh, because it breaks down the networking process into seven layers. And it's, it's, it's important to know the OSI model in terms of more than just the names and the numbers of these layers. We need to understand the functions associated with each layer, the protocols and the standards associated with each layer, how they interact, how, they, how, how these layers help with the networking process, right? So that's the idea. And the bottom uh, three are done mostly with hardware. The top ones are done mostly, mostly with software, right? But this also, again, is used even today. Um, it's used, it, even though it's been around forever, it's used very heavily as a learning tool and for, for troubleshooting networks, designing networks, right? We, this is what we start off with as a basis. So imagine if you have, you know, two people here, maybe Mike here, uh, say a colleague, and Brent, right, on the other end. So here's what happens. Mike is sending an email to Brent saying, uh, Brent, it's it's only about five minutes into the webinar, and Prague is already putting the participants to sleep. So here's what happens on Mike's machine from from the left, right? Uh, he's typed up this email and he hits send, and it kicks off this process where the data now has all the headers appropriate for each layer added to it, and then eventually each and every layer will add uh, whenever possible. And then eventually it'll be converted to a bunch of ones and zeros and transmitted across the network over towards Brent's machine, where Brent's machine will start processing these headers and use the information in these headers 
as instructions on how to process the data and how to forward it on within the device as well. First, of course, the headers will be used to get the data to the right device. And eventually within Brent's device, right, the data, uh, the instructions, the headers will be used to get the data to his email application where he gets a little ding that says, you got mail. So Brent quickly opens it up, looks at his email message and says, oh, I couldn't agree more. Got to tell Prague that to make it more interesting or something along those lines, right? So that's how this really works. And again, obviously there's a lot more to all the details of all those headers, but that's understanding those will help us understand networking really well. So physical layer's purpose in life is to determine, you know, the, the specifications of the actual medium, whether it's wireless, uh, whether it's, you know, satellite based or cellular based or wired. Right? literally specifies how the signals are to be transmitted, how thick the wire can be, how long it can be, how long the signals can be propagated without having to be regenerated, right? All that is part of the physical layer. And then data link layer, it's associated with physical addressing. Yeah, this is the identification for each device, sometimes called MAC address, sometimes called hardware address, sometimes called physical address. Uh, so. So that's a large part of the data link layer. The other part of the data link layer also specifies who can transmit when, right? How can you transmit data? Not, not, not just how, but who can transmit when and who can use this transmission medium, so to speak. So that's part of the data link layer as well. And Ethernet, for example, Wi-Fi are both standards that operate at the physical and data link layer, right? So they, they actually specify those those standards associated with the Ethernet Wi-Fi specify, right, um, how data is to be transmitted as well as who can transmit when and so on, right, as well as the medium-related information and the MAC addresses. The three network layer specifies uh, logical addressing. Notice an example of that is an IP address. Unlike a MAC address, right, MAC is hardware, this is called logical address. Typically, these addresses are assigned by the human, whether we do it manually or automatically. So that's the logical addressing. And then routing is also part of the network layer. So routers, this little hockey puck-like device, is what uh, you know is representing a router, and it will make routing decisions on which way to route data. So, so and we'll talk briefly about routing as well. And prioritization, right? The router and switches can prioritize traffic depending on who's sending it, depending on what application is being used, and so on. So all of these, are, all of these functions are associated with, associated with the network layer, and IP, Internet Protocol, one of the, the main protocols in the TCP IP suite, operates at the network layer. Now, routers operate at the network layer typically as well. Transport layer, handles, uh, again, numerous functions like segmentation, breaking up a large chunk of data into smaller segments, as they call it, yeah, and then transmit it as bytes. But, um, you know, it also uh, transmits them in what are called segments. And another pro function, critical function of the transport layer is error handling. When the recipient receives some data, at the transport layer, it will it will use the transport layer to inform the sender in case that data got corrupt on the way over, or if some data is missing out altogether. So all that's part of error handling. And on our machines, we typically are using lots of applications like emails, uh, not emails, but email, um, browsing, instant messaging, database applications, etc. Well. All that data is coming in over, say, one network connection, whether it's wired or whether it's wireless. Now, the question is, how is our device going to identify which application to send the data to? And that answer is also in the transport layer, which helps identify which protocol or which application that data is meant for. And it'll then, therefore, the device will send or route that data to the appropriate application, the process, or the um, uh, protocol itself, right? And that's how, by the way, that email made it to Brent's e email application, right? That, that Mike had sent earlier. 
So as opposed to in his browsing window, right? Within the browsing uh, window, we may have lots of tabs. Now this is the transport layer also what helps send the data to the right tab as well. And that's the beauty. So that's the OSI model, if you would, and that's the gist of um, the basics you know, uh, of the OSI model. Again, there's a lot to it. I could talk half a day uh, about the OSI model, but this gives you some idea. We won't talk about the upper layers because they're not as involved in moving the data as the lower layers are. You know? So now, switch operations. How does switching work? The way switching works is uh, or I shouldn't say switching, but the way switches work is they perform three primary functions. Right? Their first function is learning. Now, what do they learn? They learn MAC addresses. They learn MAC addresses so they can forward data intelligently. Then, as part of forwarding data intelligently, they will forward and filter. Forward only as appropriate, filter everywhere else. And there are occasions or there are circumstances under which the switch doesn't know how to forward more intelligently, so what it'll do is it'll flood it. And flooding means sending the data to out, uh, not to, but sending the data out of all ports, except the port it came in on. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about this. So here we have a small, simple network, perhaps in a lab, connected uh, with four devices with their respective MAC addresses, and all of them are connected to appropriate ports on the switch. So here's device A. It's going to send a frame to some other device. We don't know which one yet. So device A, now the device A will basically send a frame. Here it goes. And the switch receives it on port two. Now here's what the switch does. The switch looks at the source MAC address to learn which MAC address lives on which of its ports? Because this device A has sent data using its own MAC address as a source, and that data was received by the switch on port two, the switch says, aha, I just learned that this MAC address lives on my port two and puts it in its what is called a switch lookup table. Now the switch lookup table goes by lots of different names. It goes by MAC table, MAC address table, some 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 uh, vendors like Cisco even call it the CAM table. So basically, the idea there is that that information is now stored in the we'll call it the switch lookup table just for consistency's sake right now. But again, remember it goes by lots of names, right? So the purpose of this MAC address table, or switch lookup table, is to hold all the MAC addresses and what port that MAC address lives on. Now, when that happens, uh, as the switch lookup table gets built up with lots of MAC addresses, now the switch will be able to forward intelligently. But notice right now, the switch does not have the destination MAC address in its lookup table. So what it'll, it'll do is it'll flood it. It'll send it out all, the other, out all the other ports except two. And when it does, all the other devices, if you recall, take a look, this is this destination address belongs actually to device C. So when devices B, C, and D receive that frame, B and D will ignore it. C will say, oh, I better pay attention. This one is for me, because it's addressed to me. So device C will actually process that frame. The devices B and D will ignore it. They'll throw away that frame. It's not for us, not for me. Each of them will say it's not for me. Device C, though, in a normal polite network, what would device C do? It would respond. Now, as part of its response, what it'll do is it'll send out a frame. And the switch once again says, aha, I just received a frame coming in on my port seven with this source MAC address. And then, therefore, the switch adds it to its lookup table. So it now adds C's MAC address and associates that uh, with port seven. So to indicate that this port, uh, sorry, this MAC address lives on my port seven is what the switch says. And if you if you notice that the destination MAC address is that of device A's, so the switch will ask itself, do I know where the destination MAC address lives? And the answer is, of course, it's in my lookup table. It lives on port two. 
So it says outstanding. Now I don't need to flood. I can forward only on port two and filter everywhere else. That's what it does. And that's what's the, that's the main idea behind forwarding intelligently. So all the other devices don't even see the response that C sent to A. Right? It also keeps things more secure in that sense. And that's that's the beauty. So now that and so again the the point is the three key switch functions are address learning, so it can forward more intelligently. Second function forwarding intelligently, so to speak, and filtering everywhere else. And the third one is flooding. Right? Frames are flooded when the switch does not know where the destination is. So then it'll send out all ports, saying, I don't know. So it says, let me send it out to all, all, all ports. It's still addressed to the destination only. It's just that the switch doesn't know. So it will forward it out to all ports. The other times switch will flood is when the sender has intentionally sent out a broadcast. Now, when a broadcast is sent, the, by definition, a broadcast is meant for everybody. So it says, who am I to get in the way? And the switch will flood it. Right? So it'll be flooded. So that's what the switch does. Those are the three switch functions. Now, in a switch network, loops are really bad. Now, although the challenge is redundancy is really great. And sorry, the, so the redundancy is really great, great. Loops are really bad. Problem is you cannot have redundancy without loops. Okay, so that's that's a challenge. So in comes spanning tree protocol. Now, which, and spanning tree protocol's purpose in life is to break loops, right? And it does so using a complex set of um, ideas and operations. Again, I could I could go on for a day and a half talking about spanning tree protocol. Now it's it's that elaborate, but the basic idea is that these switches will communicate in some way with each other. Not all switches talk to all of them, uh, to each other, but they will communicate in a specific manner to first elect what is called a root switch, and then all the switches, the other switches figure out that they are non-root switches, and they will figure out where, uh, which ports need to be blocked on which switches. And once they do that, the, the result the equivalent result of having this port four blocked on this switch is that for all practical purposes, it'll appear as if this link is disconnected. And in doing so, it'll have effectively broken the loop. Notice it does this logically, not physically. Right? It won't cut the link off, um, physically that is. But by doing it logically, what happens is should one of the other primary links go down, then this redundant link can be enabled can, can be switched from blocking to forwarding and therefore use the redundancy but without causing any of the problems and this is only done if the main link is down or main links are down to, and therefore this redundant link needs to be enabled so that's that's the idea behind scanning people at home so it goes through an election process a path selection processing which is the best path normally and then Convergence means everything has settled down. The switches are figured out, which are the forwarding paths and which are the blocking paths or ports, respectively. Um, and then when things change, again, it needs to reconvert. Something changed in the topology. So now one of the blocking ports, one or more of the blocking ports needs to switch to forwarding. So that's how it works. And kind of cool stuff. The good news, it's on by default. Switches can figure this out on their own. The bad news, if you want to design the network efficiently, then we would have to do some configuration and we ourselves want to specify which port should be blocking and for, or not, not manually or directly, but we should influence which port should be forwarding and blocking and which switch should be the root and uh, so on. Right? So that's, that's where we need to know this and configure these things as appropriate. Routing is the other key function. Right Now, what switching does, by the way, switching forward traffic internally in our local networks. Routing helps forward traffic between networks. Right? So I like to use the analogy that routers and routing is like airlines. Airlines get us from one airport to the other. Airlines don't care how or even if we get to our final destination. As in, whether it's a hotel, whether it's friend's house, whether it's um, uh, a conference I'm going to, right, and so on. So 
uh, routers help us get from one network to another, kind of like airlines help us get from one airport to the other. But once we get to the destination airport, we would use Uber or some shuttle service, or our friend would come pick us up, right? That's the equivalent of switching. The airline is the equivalent of routing. And routing can get pretty complex also, can get pretty elaborate. Here we have four networks, so to speak, interconnected with a complex set of uh, connections. And so routers need to make some intelligent decisions on how to forward traffic most efficiently. And efficiently could take on lots of different meanings. Do, do we want the traffic to go through the shortest path or the fastest path? or the least expensive path, and so on. Right? So all of that can vary depending on how routing is being done. Now, the routing decision process, each router will at any given moment in time when it receives a packet, make a routing decision. Right? So the router will look up the destination address of each packet in its routing table. And when it does, there are three possible options or three possible outcomes. First one is that the, the router has found exactly one route matching this particular destination. So that's easy. Then the router says, okay, if there's only one route matching, I just have to do, I just have to forward it out that route or to that, you know, to the port connected to the route or associated with the route, and that's it. I'm done. The second option is there are no, or not second, I should say, but another option, another outcome is no route. That means that router does not have any route matching for that particular destination. In other words, router does not know how to forward to that destination. If that happens, the router says, well, I don't know how to get there, drops the packet, and reports the destination is unreachable back to the source. So whatever address was in the source um, of the packet, um, whatever, whatever, whatever was the source IP address, or typically IP, it could be some other protocol. Source address of the uh, of the packet received a destination unreachable message back, saying, "Sorry, I had to drop your packet. I didn't know how to forward it to other destination." And the router is not going to ask its neighbors. The router does not play Mr. Nice Guy. It says, "Look, either I know or I don't. If I know, great. If I don't, all out sorry," and drops the packet. The other. Uh, the third or final outcome is there are multiple routes matching for that particular destination. Then the router has to go through and do some more work to figure out which is the best path, right? And that includes longest match, sometimes called, um, you know, uh, the, the best match or the longest, longest match, right? Uh, most specific match, sometimes it's called, goes by a bunch of names. So it, it figures out which is the best possible match and that, like I said, requires a little bit more work from the router on the router's part. And then once it figures that out, it will forward it out that particular path or port. So those are the three outcomes, right? And, that, and again, this gets complex too, right? And routers, as you guys know, can forward packets at the rate of millions of packets per second. Very high-end routers, which cost, uh, you know, several hundred thousand dollars, can definitely keep up with a lot of traffic. But those are routers, the kind that you know, Verizon, AT&T, Comcast would buy and put in their backbone because they're moving that volume of traffic or more. But large enterprises could easily invest in routers that cost a few hundred thousand dollars because even they might be moving a fair amount of data in their enterprise networks, right? And routing metrics. Uh, metric is a term used to describe basically the unit or measurement that helps routers determine how easy to reach or hard to reach a destination network is. Right? Hop count is one of them. It is the least sophisticated, not very intelligent way of deciding how far or how easy to reach a destination network is. Because a hop could mean anything. A hop could mean you know, in, in, across the street or a hop could mean across the globe. Hop could mean over a very slow link. It could mean over a very fast link. But hops does not help distinguish between any of those, so it's not very intelligent. Bandwidth is a much more intelligent metric, a much more sophisticated metric, allows routers to make much more intelligent decisions. You know, usually the higher the bandwidth, the, the more preferred the path will be. 
And that makes sense. That's logical. Uh, or we could even have arbitrary cost designation metric. You and I can designate literally a cost for each of these links. And then routers will obviously try and figure out the lowest total cost of each path and use that path as the uh, best path to send to the uh, to send the packet through. Right. So that's that's one of the things. And the reliability, delay, and load are they may sound like they are useful, but they're actually not. They they cause more trouble than they uh, are helpful, and so those are you know it's better not to use them as a metric in making routing decisions. Again, it gets a little bit more involved than I can go into right now, but um, yeah, yeah. Uh, that so those may seem it, it, like they're useful, but they're not actually because of the other constraints or problems, right? And one of the other key things to keep in mind is the routing table only has the best path information. So even in a network like this, when you have multiple different ways to get to a destination, for example, this router has one, two, and three ways to get to some of these other destinations. And including even this one, that this router could actually route traffic this way if it wants to. It may not be the most efficient, but maybe it is. But that's why what you have to keep in mind is that routers only keep the best path in the routing table. Uh, and that best path is partly determined based on the metrics. Right. So an example would be from lane A to lane B, we have three different ways to get there. One would be this way, or at least three, maybe actually more than three, right? Uh, another would be this way. So one over the 10 megabit per second link, another out of the 155 megabit per second link. And the third way is out over the gigabit link. Now, bear in mind, this is from this router's perspective. Once it's gone to the next router, it could take multiple paths again, or potentially could take multiple paths, right? So the idea is that which is the best path from lane A to lane B will depend on the routing protocol. RIP will use the different criteria. RIP uses a metric of hops. OSPF uses a metric of cost, but it's actually based on bandwidth, and so on. Right? But obviously, you and I know that the gigabit link is the fastest, but RIP will actually think this is the best way, because it says this is the fewest hops. All the other paths involve more hops, is what RIP says, which we know is not the smartest way of doing things, right? So, because it doesn't take into account the bandwidth. So anyway, that's routing protocol operations for us, right? Again, this gets very involved. Um, then there's a lot more to it. I mean, I could easily spend five days just talking about these four protocols and the basics of routing, right? which is what I used to do when I was teaching Cisco class. Now, TCPIP is the main protocol we use on most of our networks today. So it's also very important to understand that. Not only do we use it at work, we use it at home too. You know for surfing the web, for accessing you know, our internal networks, in, including accessing our you know, YouTube or Netflix from our television. So even the TV is talking TCP IP. Right? And the idea here is, you know, the idea here is it's very important for us to understand TCP IP. You know, and all the related protocol, I should say, let me rephrase that. Not all, but it's important for us to understand the core protocols of TCP IP. And listed over here are many of the core protocols, not all. So we've got you know, IP, of course, version four, there's version six also, ICMP, TCP, UDP, ARP, and then routing protocols like EIGRP, OSPF, and all kinds of application layer protocols, including DNS, HTTP, which we obviously use a lot of. Um, so then the idea is, again, to, to truly understand networking, we must understand TCP IP really well as well. Um, so um, the, and, and, and part of that is understanding the addressing. Uh, but part of it is also addressing, a part of it, the part of understanding TCP IP is which protocols operate at which layer. This is the TCP IP model, not the, not the OSI model, but similar. Which protocols operate at which layer? 
Uh, what do they do? What functions do they perform? How they interact with other protocols? You know, what these numbers mean? These are the port numbers. So it's very important to understand all these things about TCP IP. Very important to understand the headers of TCP IP, um, of the protocols of each of the, uh, the headers of the protocols within TCP IP. So IP addresses, just like MAC addresses, we need to understand IP addresses too. IP addresses are 32 bits long, and this is IP version 4, by the way. IP version 4 are 32 bits long, which, are, which is 4 bytes. The IP address has a network ID or prefix, and what they call locally administered, or sometimes called the host ID. This is a network portion and a host portion. Together, it makes up 32 bits. And we, of course, humans, write the 32-bit address in a dotted decimal notation. Why do we use a dotted decimal notation? Because if I ask you what's the IP address of the device you're working on and you start saying it in binary like this, I'm going to complain. But I can't handle 32-bit numbers just like this. I'm not going to write this down or even read it out loud to you. Right? Maybe as a joke I might, but uh, certainly it won't be fun for you, right? So that's why we basically convert the 32-bit address into four octets, as it's called, four blocks of eight bits each, and convert each octet to decimal and separate them by dots. That's called dotted decimal notation. All right, very important to understand that. And then we also need to understand subnetting. Now, subnetting is a tough topic because it involves a bunch of rules, right? We are not always disciplined about learning the rules well. If you want to learn subnetting, you have to learn the rules really well first and then do a little bit of math. The math is not that complicated once you really understand the rules. It's understanding the rules that's the tricky part. So, the, so you know, there's a lot of things that we need to understand before we can understand subnetting. And I'll talk about that, uh, the, which of these things you need to understand in a moment. But it's when I teach subnetting in these classes, I take at least three to four hours to teach it. Why? I have to explain all the rules and how they work together, how each of them works on their own and how they work together, then teach some of the math, and then we would be ready to do subnetting. Right? So the IP address, which we said earlier, has a network portion and a host portion, now has a third tier added. And before we add the third tier, we have to ask ourselves, first of all, why are we doing that? The answer is to make the networks more manageable, to also reduce the address wastage. And how do you go about doing it? Well, for that, uh, we'd have to answer some more questions, such as how many broadcast domains or how many networks do we need? How many IP addresses do we need? How many hosts do we need to address or number per network? What is the total range of the, uh, of the addresses, right? And what is the potential for growth? Will the number of networks grow or will the number of hosts grow? Imagine if Starbucks is trying to decide how many new stores to open. Maybe not right now, but you know when things are going really well, it has to figure out, well, do we need to make uh, stores, the existing stores larger, or do we need to increase the number of stores we have? You know? and, and so that's kind of what we need to answer here as well. Do we need more networks, or do we need larger networks, or both maybe? Right? And that will de determine um, how we submit. So in order to really understand subnetting, what we need to first of all understand is the purpose. Why are we doing it? Not just we, but why do subnetting in general? And, and that's not trivial, by the way. Right? It's not simply to say make networks more manageable and reduce address waste. Right? That's, that's a very high level. We need to understand at a more deeper level the real benefit or value of subnetting. Then we have to really understand binary numbering system. Uh, and how to convert binary to decimal and vice versa. In fact, I actually typically, after teaching this conversion, I actually assign students homework. Uh, where, where I highly recommend that they do that in order to really uh, get comfortable with the conversion process manually. You can't use calculators in my class for this purpose. And then I, I also make sure that the students learn about all the IP address classes, the octet boundaries, uh, the subnet masks and the rules, there's, there's rules associated with the mask as well, the subnet mask. It's very important to understand how those 
um, masks work and what the rules are. Also, we construct a table that has two columns. One is number of bits and two is number of hosts or subnets. In other words, how many bits will result in how many hosts and how many subnets? Or the other way around. If you need so many hosts or so many subnets, how many subnet or host bits do we need? So bottom line is the 32 bits will be now divided into network, subnet, and host bits. So we have to be able to even count them. And uh, then uh, it basically makes sense of, of that. Like, so how many bits will result in how many networks? Um, how many network bits will result in how many networks? How many subnet bits will result in how many subnet? How many host bits will result in how many hosts? And that's, that's how we determine how many bits should be in each of these sections. And that's what will determine subnet. So the prefix notation also, you know, you might have seen IP addresses with a slash 16, slash 24, slash 20, slash 30, et cetera. Well, what does that really mean? It's important to understand that too. Only after understanding all this are we truly actually ready to start doing subnet. Right? So that's, that's the idea behind that. So I like to give the analogy of a pizza. You know, for some of you, it might be lunchtime. You, know, you might get hungry. The idea here is that the address, <clears throat> excuse me, the address of the unsliced pizza is the equivalent of the network address originally before subnetting. And then the address of the slice or the subnet is the equivalent of having a slice of the pizza. Right? Um, yeah. So, um, well, the, the idea here is that addressing, you know, each individual slice, not just one, but all the individual slices will basically give us the address of the subnets and the respective hosts within the subnet. So that's the general idea. Yeah. Now, like I said, I, t I take normally three to four hours to teach subnetting and all this information is I spend a bunch of time teaching all this information first. Then we do uh, actual subnet, right? And in between, students get homework. So, all right, so that's the, these are the basics of networking that we need to really understand, right? And like I said, this is just scratching the surface, but at least now you know what all you need to know to get really good at networking. And by the way, a lot of the subnetting, if once you get really good at it, you can even do things like some of the basic subnetting in your head. But here it is. Now, this this basically is to lighten things up a little bit. We've done some serious uh, uh, learning for a little bit. So take a look. I won't read these out loud. See what you think. And then prepare your questions. Go ahead and put in your questions in the Q&A box. And we'll take some of them. And I'll see, you know, um, Brent will help me, and then we can we can basically answer some of them. No. Very good. Hey, thank you so much. It's fantastic. Um, so it looks like we have about uh, about seven questions here so far. Um, again, as I'm going through these, you know, feel free to give them a thumbs up to bump it to the top of the queue. Um, you know, the uh, common question that comes up uh, is, are we going to get a copy of this, a recording of this presentation? Yes, you are. You'll get it in about a week. Um, so we'll uh, we'll jump right in here if you're ready. What happens if the switch lookup table gets corrupted? Ah, okay, excellent question. Well, again, it depends. You know, when the switch lookup table gets corrupted, um, it depends on how it got corrupted and to what degree, or you know, how much of it got corrupted, and so on. Uh, that itself could, could uh, you know, in other words, it could get corrupted in a lot of different ways to a lot of different degrees. And depending on that, uh, you know, it, the, the switch could be, um, or the problem could be addressed accordingly. But let me put it this way. Worst case scenario, in most switching environments, if you even have to completely clear the switch lookup table, and have it relearn from scratch, it's not the end of the world. It, it'll, it'll slow things down just a little bit for a very short amount of time, but switches these days are incredibly fast and they'll learn very quickly and they'll pick up and continue on, no problem. But the bigger problem might be, 
uh, have we become aware of whether it got cropped or not, and what are we going to do about it manually? Automatically, um, you know, the switches may not be able to do a whole lot, but that's the bad news. The good news, it doesn't happen too often. In fact, in most of my career, I have not known that to be a particular problem. Uh, not a particular one, right? Of all the other problems I've had to solve or deal with, that was one of the least. Um, uh, you know, so it's not too big a deal. I uh, hope that helps. Uh, if not, please follow up with another question. No, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, if there are multiple routers between two hosts, then routers do any modification and pack it during routing? Okay, yes, they do. All routers. Um, all routers will always modify the time to live. Time to live is a particular field in the IP packet. And they will decrement the time to live by one. A router is required to typically do that. And as a result of modifying the IP packet's time to live, even its checksum has to be modified. So in fact, literally when you and I type in www.amazon.com, every router between us and Amazon when, and when the request is being sent to Amazon is doing this, documenting the time to live and checksum. Every router getting between Amazon and us on the response, Amazon's web page when it's sent to our, to our browser, our computer, every router on the path back is doing the same, documenting the time to live and updating the checksum, which is why when you, when you start jamming on the refresh button, if, it, if the page doesn't load in two seconds, think about what all has to actually occur. It's actually pretty uh, elaborate, no. uh, but yes, that's what happens. Thanks. Okay, uh, the next question we have here is a, kind of a different flavor of the same question we've been asked a few times, and that is, um, do you have a resource where we can define all the abbreviations for the uh, TCP IP overview uh, that you gave? Is there somewhere you can recommend people to go um, if they are you know, kind of new to this and, and trying to figure <laughs> out all these many abbreviations? Um, I think personally, uh, you know, I, I, the way I look at it, and in fact, this does come up in all of our classes, because in the classes, students say, whoa, that's so many acronyms to remember, to learn. Here's what I tell students. I don't try to learn the acronym by itself. I try to learn the subject. And when I do, half or more of the acronyms, I learn automatically as a side effect. But if I just try to learn acronyms, it won't help me get a bigger picture, a complete understanding of things. So if, if I'm reading a book on networking, or if I'm reading a book on switching, or if I'm reading a book on routing, I'll automatically, automatically learn a lot of the acronyms associated with those topics. That's how I like to go about it. On, the, on Google, you'll find, or, you know, when you Google stuff, you'll find glossaries and of, of acronyms and whatnot. Uh, there's tons of sources, but that's not what I personally recommend in how to go about it. Yeah. Very good. Okay. okay. How to understand that which network or subnet is correct with network mask? Ah. Yeah, again, for that, you'd have to understand the IP address classes. You'd have to understand the rules of subnet masks, uh, rules of subnet masks, and, uh, you know, how many networks you need, how many subnets you need, and how many hosts you need. So once you have a clear understanding of these things, then it becomes very apparent, um, very obvious as to what, um, you know, yeah, what, what the network or subnet mask, uh, which network or subnet is correct with the network mask, right? So that's, uh, again, so going back, once you understand these things, the IP address classes, octet boundaries, subnet mask, and the rules, and how many do we need? How many addresses, how many network subnets and hosts do we need? Not networks, but how many, how many subnets and hosts do we need? Then it'll become clear. No. All right. Uh, thanks. I hope that helps. Perfect. Okay. Is the slice the network part or the client's part? Ah, the slice is neither. The slice is the subnet part. The pizza, original pizza, unsliced pizza was a network. The slice is a subnet. And think of the toppings as a, as a host or the clients. That's how I like to, that's the analogy I like to use. Think of each of these toppings as clients within the slice. That's, and that, but that's a subnet. Perfect. You know, we're doing this uh, webinar during lunch, so you're making me hungry. Yeah, yeah. sorry. 
<laughs> I forgive you. Okay, so uh, how does the discovery work when I see other computers or printers in my network view in the Windows File Explorer? Ooh, that's, um, that, that gets kind of involved in the sense that um, way back Microsoft used to use NetBIOS names, now it uses, you know, this PCP, IP, and maybe DNS. So it's been so long since I delved into that. I don't actually know today how it's, how it's done. Um, I apologize. Uh, so I don't want to, you know, say something that may not be accurate. But back in the old days, oh, God, it used to be nightmarish, right? It, it would use NetBIOS and WINS and things of that sort. Right? Today, maybe it uses DNS or, I don't know, some other protocols. Even the, the ch option of checking, you know, use file and print sharing will have something to do with it. But I can't give you a more accurate answer today. I apologize. In general, though, you don't want it to be able to discover too much, right, in networks, um, just for security reasons also. That's the, the, the recommendation I've uh, always used and followed lately. Yeah. Okay. Um, how many types of switches are in networking? Exactly 17. I'm kidding, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, how many types of switching? Uh, it depends how, how you categorize them. There are, in fact, there are a zillion different ways to even categorize, but at a very high level, you want to think of them as access distribution core. In a very large enterprise network, you, you'd have all three types, access, distribution, and core. Right? So access is what users connect to. They're, they're devices that are connected to the access switch. Uh, distribution it will aggregate a bunch of access switches, and the core is kind of in the backbone. Right? So that's 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 one way I would categorize them. Um, yeah, that's that's probably that's probably what I would say. Yeah. Very good. If do I'm designing network, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. No, no, no you're good. Um, do switches use IP addresses? Yes and no. In a sense, sometimes switches have built-in routing capabilities, in which case it's literally the switch, one box, one chassis is called a switch, but it also has a full functional router in it. So it's performing both the functions, switching and routing, in which, in which case it has multiple IP addresses and it's using them. But if a switch does not, if it's purely a layer two device, switching is normally done at layer two, uh, then you may still assign one IP address, at least to the switch, and you could assign more than one potentially, to manage the switch so that you could connect the switch using TCP IP remotely and manage it, configure it, and you know, troubleshoot it, and so on. But otherwise, if it's a layer two switch, it, it doesn't really use IP addresses for any of its primary functions. No? Okay. Um, how switch handles multi multicast packets? How switch handles multicast packets? Okay, the way switches, by default, the way they handle multicast packets is very inefficient. They'll actually treat them as broadcast packets and just send it out all ports, which is, you know, something that fundamentally defeats the whole point of having multicast. But that's the default behavior on certain switches. On, on smart switches, or I shouldn't say smart, on, on intelligent switches, on advanced switches, should they can be configured to learn to intelligently forward multicast packets only as needed. Now, usually what that means is the switch is gonna be somewhat expensive, right? Um, not terribly so though. These days, a lot of the switches we use are already somewhat expensive. And so they usually have that capability of being uh, trained or being configured to handle this more intelligently. So, yeah, but it does need that additional capability, right? So yeah, that's the, that's, uh, basic answer. Perfect. Okay. Uh, the OSI model is a conceptual framework used to describe the functions of a network. <laughs> I think that's the answer. Yeah, the that, that was someone that answered the question that we already answered. So thank you, Pamela. <laughs> okay. Um, next, uh, can switch be both layer two and layer three? Correct. Yes, it can. Um, that's what I meant. When I said a switch can have a router built into it, that means it's a layer three device as well. Uh, so that means it's a layer three switch. That's what we call it. Sometimes you call it multi-layer switch. Sometimes you call it um, layer three switch. Sometimes you call it something else. You know, um, I wouldn't call it a smart switch though. That's not what that means. Um, in fact, I don't like to use the term smart switch at all in general, just to eliminate any confusion. 
Um, so yeah, other you know if it's if if a switch is strictly layer two, that means it does not have routing capability. If it if it ha if it's layer three, that means it has routing capabilities. Yeah. All right. Perfect. We'll take uh, two more questions here, and then wrap it up. Um, so the first is, uh, what is the yeah. difference between the OSI seven layer model and the TCP IP four layer model? Uh, it's just how we categorize the different functions. It, you know, for all let, let me put it this way: both of them handle the same set of functions. It's just how they categorize them. TCP/IP model uh, categorizes the layers one and two of the OSI, OSI model into one layer called called interconnection or access, um, the inter interface uh, access layer, right? Uh, and the upper three layers are one. So that's how it does that. And then network and transport are, you know, specifically internet and transport. Uh, they're just six or one half a dozen of another kind of. It's, yeah. The, the main thing to know is the what are the functions being performed at which layer, right? That's to me more, more important. It doesn't matter what you call it, how you categorize it. That would be my answer. Gotcha. Okay, final question, and we'll let you off the hook here. <laughs> what are the data link layer protocols? Uh, uh, again, Ethernet and Wi-Fi, uh, but like Ethernet, there's so many others, right? Um, PPP and um, um, let's see. Uh, well, back in the old days, we had SLIP, but they, you know, so many other technologies like ATM, frame relay. Um, Etc. MPLS all operate layer two. So that'd be data link layer technology. But even at the fundamental level, Ethernet, Wi-Fi, etc. I would say um, are some of the data link layer protocols. Back in the old days, we also had ArcNet and Token Ring and things of that sort. Don't use them anymore. Yeah. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Prag. We really, really, really appreciate you taking the time to uh, to do the presentation and then also to answer all these questions. Thanks to everyone for the fantastic questions. I uh, hope you enjoyed today's webinar. If you'd like to learn a little bit more about this topic, we recommend the Understanding Networking Fundamentals course from, uh, from Global Knowledge. Um, and as an attendee of today's webinar, we want to make it easy for you to take the next steps. So you can use the discount, discount codes to save 25% off your next Global Knowledge course. You can use either Webinar 25 in the US or CA Webinar 25 in the Great White North of Canada. Um, finally, I want to be sure to continue to visit Global Knowledge's website to access additional free resources like technical articles, white papers, and wonderful webinars like this. Um, if you have any other additional questions you think of after the fact, please, please reach out to us on our social media, uh, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, whatever you prefer. Uh, let's make those social media folks earn their paychecks. So uh, reach out to them. They can get you guys hooked up with the answers that you need. Um, so with that, Prague, thank you again. Appreciate it so much. Uh, I'm going to go grab some pizza because you made me hungry. Uh, everyone stay oh. safe. Happy hand washing. <laughs> Thanks to all. All right. Thank you very much, Brent. And thank you all, guys. I hope you, uh, hope you guys learned and look forward to seeing you guys in some of my classes. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Have a great day, everyone.